Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual breakfast sessions. I'm Larry Sashin, your host. Uh, today, we've brought together a great panel of people to discuss how do you squeeze $1.25 out of every dollar you spend in your business. Now, for those people who are in food service, we're going to be speaking your language. For those people not in food service, although we speak food service, all of our uh, topics are universal to business. So sit back, get ready, and let's have some fun. Uh, before we start speaking about the topic, what I'd like to do is go around the room and everybody identify yourselves. So why don't we start with Charlize? Good morning, everyone. I am Charlize Rookwood. I'm a vegan chef and blogger and the host of the Black Vegan Cooking Show. Thank you. And Sean, how about you? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Wheaton. I'm the VP of Culinary Services for Cuisine Solutions, which is a global uh, sous vide food manufacturer. And Peter. Good morning, everyone. Peter Herrero, New York Hospitality Group. We are a hospitality group of five different companies um, in the Westchester area of New York City. Uh, from barbecue to black tie events is our event business. Okay, and Fred. Good morning, I'm Fred Clashman. I'm the editor and publisher of Total Food Service. We cover the food service industry across the nation. And Mike. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Gansel. I'm a, a business consultant. The name of my company is Voice of Reason Consulting. I'm a partner with Larry in the Strategic Advisory Board initiative that we've been working on for the last two years. Thank you, everyone. Um, so squeezing $1.25 out of every dollar you spend. You know, there's an old joke that uh, goes, you know, children nowadays are so much stronger than children were when I was a child. Why? Because when I was a child, it took a whole family of people to carry $25 worth of groceries. And now an eight-year-old can carry it in one hand. Now that's funny, but it's not. Because truthfully, our incomes have not kept up, kept up with that. And if you run a restaurant or any business, it's hard to charge what it now costs you to do business. So Peter, um, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you, um, you run a restaurant, a wonderful restaurant in White Plains. And in the last five years, I've seen many changes. But you told me something very, very interesting on how you found some of your most, the easiest cost cuts you've had by watching your dishwasher. Talk about that, and then let's go into the climate in your restaurant on how things happen and how you got to watching dishwashers. Let's be honest, in any kitchen, it's the unsung hero. He, keeps, he or she keeps everything moving, and they are really at the, 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 the heartbeat of the kitchen. Um, I talk to the dishwasher. I bring them... I mean, I can tell you which dishwasher's on and what they drink and their preferences, but they can tell you what's coming back in the dishes, what people are eating, what they're not eating. And as much as Larry, I love coleslaw. I think it looks good on, on a plate. Our clientele, and we have a barbecue company. We sell a ton of, bar, a ton of coleslaw in our barbecue company, <laughs> literally a ton of it. But in a bistro, it looks really pretty. It doesn't sell. They weren't eating it. And there was a cost to it. I mean, we did leverage it because it was part of our prep list and our core product from the everyday, uh, from Great American Barbecue Company. But the dishwashers are fantastic. Uh, we had a problem with uh, several weeks ago with glassware breakage. He could tell me who was breaking it, who was coming in, who was doing what? It was fantastic. And we changed our glass, uh, our glasses six months ago, and the new racks are a little shorter, so they're being dinged. Uh, I, to, to me, the dishwasher 
has no agenda. He's not covering his assets, if we may call it that. Um, but it's been phenomenal. And he really helps us control our silverware, glassware, supplies, cost, food cost, everything. It's really been for us a, a unsung hero. I hopefully that uh, that comes across right. Yes, great, great. Sean, yes. your company specializes in portion control. Um, tell the audience a little bit about how you, why that's very important. Portion control is, is a key part of cost savings. What we do in portion control is, is managing waste. Um, that was one of the first lessons you learned in, cul in culinary school was to, to catch waste and make use of it wherever you can, avoid waste wherever you can, um, and in helping, helping lab labor savings. If you buy, bring something in that's already portion controlled, then you, have, then you need one less uh, prep cook in the kitchen. Okay. Having something that's uh, that's that's pre cooked saves on 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 uh, trim waste. So it's kind of a two for one. You're saving on on physical waste and saving on labor waste. Okay, you know, I I sort of jumped ahead of myself. Let's talk a little bit about the the climate in the industry, Fred. Fred, you speak to restaurateurs every single day. Um, what are you hearing across the country? And 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 why saving a a quarter, a penny, a nickel per plate is so important? Well, I think I think it's part of building an efficiency too. As we've talked about, um, most restaurateurs, in order to survive, either grew their takeout and delivery businesses or entered the takeout and delivery space for the first time. So now the challenge is, how do I continue this revenue stream that I built efficiently in takeout and delivery? And at the same time, how do I welcome back guests into my, into my dining? So in order to do that, this creation of this magical dollar 25 has become essential in order to survive. So there's a lot of pieces that go with this from packaging to food costs, et cetera. The, it, it goes in, across a number of different platforms. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, I, I, I see, you know, if, if you think back, to 2019 and what the average menu looked like at that point and um and now what it looks like today it, it, it's it's an obvious thing because menus that were three four pages are now one or two maybe two sides of one page or they're one um and you see the number of items being put on a page, the varieties have been honed down so that items are used. And when you go into the kitchen itself, um, less goes into um, the trash bin. It has to be, you know, if, if, if you have produce in front of you, not so much of it is going into the garbage anymore like it used to. Um, Charlize, you know, you, you you just did a video that was incredible on on using every drop of a pineapple. Um, <laughs> can can you can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, the pineapple. So um, that came from um, I'm half Jamaican, half Mauritian. So this is just digging back to my roots and things that my grandma just naturally did in Jamaica growing up as a little kid and um. We did an event for um, Eric Adams last month and it was 200 people and he needed a plant-based menu. I approached, because of so much waste, I approach my menus now with the mindset of what ingredients I'm gonna use and what can I get out of that ingredient more so than what I feel like doing. Um, he's a huge, huge fan of pineapples and coconuts. That was his request. So I said, okay, we're going to do a, a rum pineapple sorbet and we'll do um, something with coconuts. And I said, right, we're going to find a way to use, I mean, we had like 150 pineapples. And I said, right, there's going to be a lot of skin left over. And I, I literally, the light bulb went off 
my grandma in Kingston used to boil the pineapple skin and make this amazing fragrant pineapple tea that would fill the house with this wonderful smell. So we literally, after we made everything, we got all the pineapple skin in big Dutch pots and boiled it overnight and reduced it down and made this amazing pineapple tea. I felt less guilty at the end of the evening, <laughs> putting everything in the compost. And with the coconut, we did a similar thing. Once we'd grated all the coconuts down and used that for the, uh, for the curries, we put it in the dehydrator, we dried it out and we made cute little pots of body scrubs with the cucumbers, with the coconuts and gave every guest a little pot to take home. So um, I'm really being mindful of the ingredients I use now. And once upon a time, the first thing wasn't, what can I get out of that ingredient? Now it is, now I'm like, right, if we're gonna use this, how many things can we get out of it? Even things for guests to take away. Thank you, thank you, Peter. You know, you and I had a conversation once about how many times every single ingredient you bring into your restaurant must be used? How many different ways it must be used to be cost efficient? Can you talk a little bit about that? I, I can. And it's funny, we were just in a meeting yesterday. Um, the efficiencies that we need to run in our business is beyond what I've seen in the last 40 years. We take a look at all our SKUs every single thing that we buy. And if it's only used in one or two dishes, I want it substituted with something that we make on a regular basis. And it doesn't mean specials. Specials are the seasonal. They're the one-offs. They are when the chef goes to the farmer's market and he goes every Wednesday. Um, he's there now. So the problem is, is if we don't buy the full case, if we can't negotiate a pallet deal, if we can't um, buy it, I don't mean to say in bulk, but it can be quality. We don't buy everything in bulk, but you get the, we all know you get the best price. You can negotiate. There's only so many items that you can keep track on. But the great part is, is that when we negotiate this, it really goes through our menu. You've, we've all heard the 20-80 uh, the rule. 20% of what we do gives us 80% of our results. and it's so true. We've gotten rid of so many items. And I don't mean to say get rid of, but we can't touch everything. The biggest challenge we've had in the last couple of years is we used to do volume. We don't do that volume anymore. So instead of making five gallons of something, five gallons of a soup, we're trying to get back to 10, 15, and 20 gallons. 50% of labor is really the setting up and the breaking down of someone's station. It's up 50% goes into making the product. So if I'm doubling or tripling the recipe, and Sean, you mentioned before about portion control, it's phenomenal. You can really just on the, that soup, on the brisket, on whatever it may be, you can really drop your labor costs significantly. We've looked at, and I, I'm embarrassed to say, I would have never done this years ago, the amount of quality uh, added product. We're now buying hamburger a better quality hamburger, grass-fed, pre-portioned in six unit containers. It's, uh, you can call it sous vide, you can call it seal vac. I'm amazed at the amount of labor we're saving by putting together food, but just, it used to take them an hour just to make it hamburger patties. We don't do it anymore. And it's actually lower food cost and a higher product. All right. Hmm. What, what a lead in for Sean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, that, that's perfect. Right? <laughs> and that is very much the talking point when we go out and talk to clients and partners is, is cross utilization. Don't bring in whether it's whether it's a chicken breast or a, a three bone short rib. Don't bring in whatever that product is and use it in one place. Don't treat it when, when we when we sell a short rib to a hotel or a restaurant it's an ingredient. It's not a cuisine solution short rib. I want you to take that and make it your own. You know, we, don't, we don't want to replace the chefs in any of the restaurants. We want to help them do a better job and, and, and make the most use of the resources they have. And they so don't let, me, let me break in for one people. second, Sean. Um, for the people who are not familiar with sous vide, there are some people that live under a rock. Um, can you tell them what sous vide is and how 
ordering whatever you call it, whatever Peter calls it, how that saves money for the restaurant. Sure. So boiling sous vide as a as a as a concept and as a cooking method um, in its most simple form is encasing a product, whether it's a chicken breast or a carrot, in a second skin, usually plastic. Um, and then submerging it in, wa in a water bath at a very precise temperature to cook it and be able to achieve the same result every single time. Okay. When you, cook, when you cook over open flame, there's always varying degrees of temperature and, and, and inconsistency of product, but water maintains temperature exceptionally well. So when you submerge a carrot at 86 degrees Celsius, it doesn't matter whether your carrot it, whether it's today or tomorrow, the water is always going to be 86 degrees and that carrot is always going to be the same texture when it comes out of the water. The same goes for chicken or short ribs or whatever the product is. So that's sous vide in a nutshell. Um, Cuisine Solutions buys the carrots, buys the chicken breast, buys the short rib, um, and we do the sealing and cooking for the restaurants, for the airlines, for the cruise ships. And, and the idea is by doing that, by sealing a chicken breast, a chicken breast is a great example, and we've done a couple of studies we can talk about another time or later, later in the program, where buying a chicken breast from raw, by the time you take it out of the case, drain it, trim the little bit of fat that's off of it, you've already lost 10 to 15%. If you have to cook a chicken breast on a grill to 165, like the health department says, you're losing another 20, 25%. You can lose up to 40% of the weight of your chicken just getting from the case to the plate, whereas, in sous vide, because we're sealing and we're cooking at a slower, at a lower temperature and we're cooking for a longer time, we're not losing all of that moisture. So we can retain moisture, we can retain weight, and that weight gets translated onto the plate. So while it's a higher invoice cost, you're actually, you're actually saving money on that chicken breast pound for pound, right? So your, your, your food cost overall is coming down and you don't have a prep cook trimming the chicken and grilling the chicken and doing whatever it is, especially helpful in banquet situations. Um, so what we, yeah, we are, we, are, we are the prep cook for the restaurants, for the hotels that give an ingredient to the chefs to make their own, add your own sauce, add your own garnish. Um, and hey, Sean, take a, sec take a second and just talk about, so net, net, what's chicken a pound right now? Um, chicken a pound right now. Ooh. A prox. I think depends what part of the chicken we were at. We were at okay. four something for a breast, or four something for thighs, and six for breasts. Last okay. Week. So let's so let's so let's work with five dollars. So yeah. what's what's the net going to be with your chicken breast versus the chicken breast that has to go through all those other steps? So the chicken breast that's coming from us when you buy it at at, at you know, if, if, so. If a chicken breast raw is five dollars a pound, you're going to pay us six fifty a pound for it, right? I'm, I'm, okay. I'm pulling, I'm, don't quote me on that. I'm pulling. No, 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 no. There's no. I'm just trying to. I just want our audience to just get a general picture where we're going here. All right. So if you're so, paying, so there's a buck and a, Go ahead. If you're paying five dollars a pound for a chicken raw, by the time you take it out of the case, uh, have a prep cook trim it, and then give it to somebody else to throw on the grill, and and, and that that six ounce chicken breast that's going onto the plate. Um, is now costing you nine dollars a pound, right? Okay. You, you've lost you've lost as much as forty percent of your weight between the case right. and the plate. If you take a Cuisine Solutions chicken breast that's already fully cooked, you don't have to take it back to one sixty five. It's a ready to eat product. If it's going on a salad, you can just chop it and put it on the salad cold. Yeah. You can also warm it, but because it's fully cooked, ready to eat, Health Department FDA, you don't have to take it to one sixty five. So you're not losing that much moisture. You can reheat it to. You just have to hit. If you're going to hop hold, you have to reheat. Have to hit 135. But basically, you just need to warm it through. So there's and then, a and then hold, all right. So one second, then Peter, you're paying you're paying your guys 1750, 18 an hour minimum right now. Uh, minimum. I don't know anybody who's paying minimum, um, but minimum is is six uh, fifteen. Uh, we're paying uh, anywhere be frontline anywhere between eighteen to twenty five. Everyone's getting okay. five to 12 hours overtime. So that will yeah. add another $1.50. Okay. But Sean, if I may interrupt one second, yeah. I, I, I think because we've used your product for catering, yeah, it's really, and Fred, you're, you're, you're at the doorstep on this one. It's the labor. 
It is the labor. It is the supplies. We have no labor, no supplies to get that finished product. Open it up after warming up and we're serving. And we've done some really nice high-end catering uh, jobs that they wanted so many products. Do you know what the great part is? There was no waste. There's always waste in catering because it has to be. When you have the boiling water, what do I need, Sean? What I apologize off the top of my head. How many minutes do I need to bring that up to temperature? Depending on the product, twenty minutes. I mean, it could if it's a, if it's a chicken breast, 10, 15 minutes. Short if ribs. It's short, if, it's a free, if it's a short rib, if it's the if it's the pre-portioned ones, it is twenty-ish, twenty minutes. Got it. So just before the event, we started the event. It was an event for two hundred people. We had a hundred portions all laid out. And we just kept heating it up. No, I apologize. It was 125. But the best part was is we almost had no waste at all right. and no labor on that product getting to the day of the event. Sorry, Sean, go ahead. No, that's a that's a great example. And that's something you know, I mentioned earlier a couple of studies that we've done with hotel groups. And and we did a we did a study several years ago with a major hotel group where we, we kind of saturated the menu with our products. It was a heavy banquet operation. This is pre-pandemic when there was still labor to be had. Um, and, and over the course of four months, they eliminated their overtime wow. in, their, in their banquet kitchen That's because big. they didn't have somebody, they didn't have to have all those cooks opening cases, trimming meats, grilling them, chilling them. They, they were able to, as you say, have the, have the product there, have your 20% overage for a catering event, for a banquet event, but don't heat it up until you know how many people actually walk in the door, and then you're not, and then you're not wasting any product. That product is still sealed and pasteurized in a pouch to be used for tomorrow's event. Much less product going in the trash can at the end of the day, and that's the that's the key. That's it's reducing waste and reducing labor. Not having all those people standing around in a prep kitchen, um, using the labor that you have in ways that the guest is actually going to appreciate. Use those people to put a little extra touch on the plate and, and, and make it something that's gonna be Instagram worthy. Do something that the guest is gonna recognize and appreciate because they don't care who raises their short ribs as long as it's hot and delicious when it gets on the plate. And that's, that's, the, that's the takeaway, that's the key to what Cuisine Solutions brings to the table. Now you're talking short ribs, you're also talking, there's also vegan forms of this that is a, you have a large vegan menu also so it's it's not just meats and things like that charlise um you just said you just did a, an event for 200 people how does this fit into what these what the guys are talking about how does this fit into something like what you're what you do with these customized events it's quite interesting actually because i'm learning a lot on this one. Um, I'm going to have to talk to Sean after this. Yeah. <laughs> he shared, um, shared some amazing things. Obviously, I'm dealing with um, fresh produce mainly. So the waste is insane um, with the amounts of kales and um, it would be amazing. He was just talking about carrots, like kind of getting everything sealed and nutrition held inside and just already there instead of just labor like peeling a billion carrots and I would love to eliminate a part of that process for events of that size I wish I knew Sean before I did that event <laughs> <laughs> but um, when something of that size comes up I'm definitely gonna um, look into that now and come back to you but I'm finding that I'm having to do um, a lot of freezing with fresh produce now it's um it's not ideal because um you know, the quality after your defrosting isn't amazing. But with things like um, kales and broccolis of all those stems and all that trim back, which ends up being to the roof, we're having to freeze everything now in our huge kind of catering freezers. And when we come around to doing events where we have to do smoothies or breakfast catering, we're then pulling it all back out then, getting it in the blender and trying to use it in, in other ways. You know, we just that that's what you just basically stated was like the name of the game here. This is the, the reasons why, you know, we, we have these so that people can get new ideas. But let's go back to basics. Let's go back. You don't know if you're making money or losing money 
if you don't know what every little item step costs. Mm. The accounting behind, you know, it's great. It, somebody, you know, you see, I sold 700 hamburgers today. They add up the totals and find out they lost 75 cents for every hamburger they sold. Why? Because they didn't take into account the labor, the materials, the returns, the refires. Peter, I know when it comes to that sort of thing, you don't have all this in your head, but you have a spreadsheet that is at your fingertips at all times. Um, how do you work that? How do you break down each individual item so that you know what costs and how you work it? Um, I hate the, I, I love this expression and I hate it because it's in my head driving me crazy. If you cannot measure something, you cannot manage it. We have, and any, any of your major or your prime vendors will have, we happen to deal with Cisco, it's called Studio. And whatever we buy, the cost of that is in this program. We measure everything out. And I have to tell you, I'm, I've been amazed when we measure everything out. Yeah, 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 you've been making it for five years. When you measure everything out and you look at it and all of a sudden, I'm going to pick on um, a salmon, a regular farm-raised salmon. And you're like, holy cow, how much is the protein? And how much is the vegetable? And how much, and how much is the prep? And how much is the labor? When you add it all in, what I love about these programs, you could do it on an Excel spreadsheet on your own. It won't be as accurate. It'll be a little more labor intensive. But by pricing everything out and checking it and then checking looking at on a master board to see how it's being prepped, who's prepping it, when it's being prepped, the waste, the whole nine yards, it's phenomenal. We've taken our portion of protein down from it used to be hand cut at eight, eight and a half, nine to six and a half ounces. And it is now a Faroe Island. It, we are selling not just salmon, but a specific healthy good for the environment fish with a different type of pro, uh, sorry, uh, starch and vegetable. And it really makes a difference. The consumer, at least our consumers, when you say uh, one is organic coffee that we sell, it is more expensive. But I will tell you, when you bring it down to ounces, it's not that expensive. And there, it, customers will pay a slight premium for it. We have a cafe that we do this and we've gotten two other contracts because the hospital turned around and goes, what are you doing? You're serving organic coffee in our hospital. So if you can't measure something, and I mean across the board, rip through your balance sheet. It took us a year and a half just to get control of our utilities. And I'm embarrassed to say I watched the utility rate, but it wasn't the utility rate that was killing us. It was our demand charge, which was 40% of our bill. So we could all rip through our, our uh, balance sheets. But if you can't measure something and you can't know how you're using it, Sean brought up a good example before. He is a premium product, but I'm not paying for labor. I'm not paying for supplies. I'm not paying for time on my stove. Well, what's the value to that? By dissecting everything and i mean everything supplies we've gotten crazy the difference between a supply and a disposable unless you measure it you can't manage it right now you're measuring and everything that you're everything. doing that you also you also have a hand on waste then don't you yeah yep yes. we're, we're it, it, it's waste and waste is all through the product. Waste of what the customer's not eating. Waste what's left in the pan. What Waste what's left on the cutting board. Waste is everywhere. And I, we had a big meeting years ago. We just had it again. I don't want to add more employees to the company. Mm -hmm. I just want to pay everybody much better. But then you're not, you're, you're not a worker. You're not a drone. You're not a dishwasher. You're a sanitation. You're on the sanitation team. And our secret, it's 
for the most part it's working is teams. Now I will tell you, people will self-manage themselves to a degree. And if a team's not working, you talk to two, three or four, and you find out who the culprit, who's dragging everybody down very, very quickly. Um, but it really does help having, we have studio. I mean, there's so many food costing items out there, but I suggest to everybody, do you know how much you're paying for a kilowatt? You can negotiate that. Do you know how much you're using per hour? And your bill will tell you, because they love to give you 100% tax on that. Um, it took us 18 months. We took our um, utility bills. It, it was a brutal 18 months. It's not my, um, it's not my expertise. We're $185,000 a year. It's about $15,000 a month. We, we got down to 95,000. Wow. Uh, it was, uh, I can tell you the color of a light bulb. I can <laughs> tell you it's wattage, LED, variable speed motors in our um, walk-ins. I mean, I know showing, you, you probably have the, um, we're all jealous of your refrigerators and freezers. Do you know there's a variable speed for the, comp uh, for the compressors in your walk-ins? Everything needs to be managed. And if you can't measure it, I don't mean to com com uh, keep repeating myself. You, you measure it and you look at it, you go, woof, mm -hmm. that's not right. Yeah, so I'm part of being a, being a business owner and being and managing a business. You have to learn to be an expert on everything. You have to learn to be an expert on, on the electrical <laughs> grid and, and what your kilowatt hour is. And, and, how, to, and how to manage the dollar renovation the, now. But that through a $2 million renovation right now. And I, it's killing me. I look at the contractor and his people. I will tell you, we bribe everybody. Cappuccinos or coffee <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> everybody eats lunch with the chef. Yeah. And you're walking into a commissary, everybody, and you're eating with the chef. And we have on a hot day, gelato in the afternoon. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's interesting. Waste. You know, waste costs money. But it costs money two different ways. And, and, and here's, you know, I keep going back to Peter because he has a lot of good ideas. He has a lot of good ideas. Peter, here's... There's two different types of waste. There's the waste, like you just said, leaving the lights on, um, you, you know, uh, when you trim, when you trim the meat, with, you know, with Sean is here. But there's that waste of what comes back to the dishwasher. Not the stuff that's being taken out, but the stuff that's being thrown away. And there's got to be analyzation of the waste. And just like in any business, there has to be analyzation of the waste. Are people not eating it because there's too much on their plate? That was actually a question that I was going to bring up yeah. for Peter. You, you mentioned the, the salmon specifically, that a portion used to be eight, eight and a half, nine ounces, and you've gone down to six. How much of that was looking at the dishwasher and seeing that you have a little bit of salmon left on almost every single plate? Are people willing to... Uh, like? Five years ago, 10 years ago, the expectation was because we're in America, you had to serve eight, 12, 20 ounce portions of everything. It's, but, the, but nobody ever actually ate it all. So, or this the te sounds terrible. Uh, they didn't leave too much of the salmon, but they left the, and it killed the chef. They left the vegetable. And, and to Charlize, says, ah, I knew it. Bad customer. <laughs> <laughs> say something. So to your point, Sean, they're eating the whole dish. And I'm sorry, when you're eating the whole dish, a true chef to me, his vegetable, his starch is off the hook. Yeah. You gotta eat it all. And I want you to have a little room for a shareable dessert. Yeah. Yeah. That's the key. Okay, so Charlize. If the vegetables, now we're, we're back to waste and how do you control waste? So if the vegetables are coming back, maybe the steamed or sauteed, the five green beans that are just thrown on there. And, and, and it's not you, Peter, it's in general. The yeah. vegetables on any plate are an afterthought. So Charlize, how do they make those vegetables work for them? Wow. Okay. So obviously I'm just eating with vegetables. <laughs> so that's so much that... harder. Shillies. Okay. Hold on one second. Yeah. Think about that for a second. Yeah. Um, James, unmute yourself. Hello, everybody. 
Um, Tell everybody who you are. Yes, so James Corwell, um, certified master chef, sustainability chef, also plant-based focused at at the moment. Um, To your question, I find that most of the butchering and manufacturing of food has gone up the food chain to the corporate level. But you bring up a good point, Larry. Where can the chef really show his craftsmanship? And it's in the vegetables and starches. So you can have a wonderful short rib, but maybe you have a great uh, Genoa style lasagna as the starch and vegetable at the top at 12 o'clock on the plate and a wonderful sauce to go with it. So obviously portioned correctly, but therein lies the nut of what a chef does is cook something delicious and in a crafty kind of way. So between you and Charlize, how does, how does, and I, I'm not going to say Peter because Peter is, I eat every vegetable on Peter's plates, <laughs> uh, but how does the average chef get away from steaming peas and carrots and throwing a boiled potato on a plate <laughs> and saying, Hey, we gave him vegetables. <laughs> I guess in my case, I would never handle a vegetable like that, first and foremost, and, and I never have. But you're the minority. I am the, my, I am the minority, and I'm guessing on my, the plates that I'm presenting, my vegetables are not kind of competing with the ribeye or the salmon or the shrimp or the lobster. So I guess the attention that I'm going to give to my Jamaican jerk oyster mushrooms, that vegetable actually is the highlight on the plate so it doesn't really kind of get ignored because it is the star so i guess i am kind of speaking from a minority space okay Um, but how do yes that's the star and on a vegan dish that's the star hmm. but i got to believe yes that 85 to 90 percent of all the vegetables served in the united states Hmm. are not the star they're not. You're right. They're not. They're just some little satellite planet someplace. So how do we make okay. that satellite look like the moon, the full moon? So come to one of my events. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, well, you have to integrate it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I find if you can't do separate little piles of vegetables where that's become passe, create... Um, you know, an autumn vegetable stew or a winter vegetable stew, ragu, what have you. Um, a sweet potato and apple bacon hash. Um, you know, hash is another good way to bring a lot of vegetables in play to add focus to the plate and to integrate it with the protein. Great, great. Charlize, what do you have to pick up on that? I mean, I've seen some of your videos with some of the the stews and things that you make. How does how does the average everyday chef make it so his vegetables are not throwaways? What kind of hashes and stews? I, I think James um, hit the nail on the head. It's in it's not kind of just putting a green bean or a piece of courgette on a plate. It's how you incorporate it into something really delicious. I do a lot of stews, also a lot of curries, um, where I'll put eggplants and cassava, and it's it's just incorporating it into a really flavorsome dish where people can't necessarily identify what that vegetable is, but they're just eating something delicious that it's incorporated into. I think that's the key. It's combining vegetables into something flavorsome instead of just placing them individually on a plate which gives people the opportunity to kind of push them around and think about oh I'm not so keen on carrots I when I present my food um you don't necessarily know what veggies are in that dish that you're eating but it tastes damn good isn't that how we used to feed our kids vegetables Yes. We used to incorporate it into the yeah, job. Basically, yeah. treat, like treat that. them like children and disguise everything. <laughs> to make it look and smell good. It's not yeah. a pile of green and orange stuff. Make Spend a little prep. Exactly. And it's so much easier to put out because truly, once your peas and carrots and all these things get cold, they're horrible. 
They are. They, it's like the, la the last event I did, I had um, at the end of it, um, Eric Adams came into the kitchen and he said, I have detested okra since I was a little kid. And he said, but the way you presented that okra, he was like, I don't know how you did it, but it's like, it. so it's about how you present it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, okra, okra is is the vegetable version of a slug. Yes, <laughs> right. No, it literally it's a love it's a love hate. But I have yeah, but it, but it any, tastes I've wonderful. Many a person into loving okra, you know, if you uh, put the right seasonings and turmeric and ginger and garlic and mm. you're incorporating. It smells so. How can I hate this thing? Because it exactly. smells so good and it looks so good. Instead of <laughs> take that stuff throw it on the plate and it's only going you might as well put a cardboard picture there instead because they're both going to end up in the same place absolutely so you talk about waste spend a little time think a little bit about what you're putting out there and things won't be wasted and lo and behold you know this is another this is what we're going to be speaking about at the at the virtual breakfast session at the plant-based world expo once you start making it smell good, look good, and people taste it, that's when people will say, what is that that's on the plate over there? It smells so good. Um, tune in in yeah. a couple of weeks for that one. Um, but adding, adding drama, right? So everybody loves the, 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 that sizzling fajita through, through the restaurant. Um, how do you get that? And that, that was, a, I think that was a different breakfast session that you did. Well, what's over, what, what are they eating over there? Yes. Um, so how do you get that into vegetables? And, and I think as, as chefs, as restaurateurs, we all need to be conscientious of, of everything that goes on the plate. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And if you can't, if you don't understand what you're putting on the plate, like, if you're not understanding the full picture of the guest experience, you know, that, is, that, that boils down to the mashed potatoes and green beans. Every single part of what goes onto the plate and what goes in front of the guest is part of that experience. And they're going to judge you on that. So your vegetables have to be just as thoughtful as, as the protein, if not more, because right. that's, that's where you have the space to really kind of let your imagination run wild. Uh, a perfect example. My wife will not eat cooked peas, cooked carrots. But she eats fried rice. It's in every fried rice, peas and carrots. She eats them. But you put peas and carrots on a plate, she goes, hmm. So mm -hmm. if you take those vegetables, like, you know, like James said, like Charlize, what everybody's saying here, if you take those vegetables and you work out a little tiny dish called autumn melange, and you put it on their plate and it smells good, looks good, and people take a taste, they go, oh my God, that's great. But I digress. This is very classic. <laughs> but I think, I think too, what's being cooked over there, we're talking about signature dishes. When they're that good, these are unique to the property. And I find that most restaurateurs right now are looking to get to that great level of signature quality food. And vegetables are a huge component of that. Absolutely, absolutely. And you mentioned earlier, we, we, as, as, as we've gone through the last few years and as the labor market has tightened up, menus have shrunk. We've gone from, from those three, four page books that you used to get to one page, two pages, where people have, have focused in on a handful of signature items that they can execute amazingly well with the two, three cooks that are in their kitchen. So when you get down to that, you, you, you really have to be paying attention to everything that's going on the plate. It all has to jump out and be amazing. You don't have room on your, in your kitchen and in your space and with your labor to, do, to be able to do a little bit of everything that's going to speak to everyone. But you have to have do a few things amazingly well mm -hmm. um, and have to give them 100% of your attention. Yes, Peter. Yeah, Peter. Uh, Larry, to Sean's point, it, I like the way you just said it, Sean. We have to speak to all our clients. Some of it, some of them are vegetarian. Some don't eat pork, don't like fish, don't like okra, but some of them love wine, beer, ciders. It, it is, I, I almost find it, we are so much 
somewhere simplified in our food and beverage offerings right now. So it's allowing us to work on the environment, staff training, on all our, what they used to call overhead. To me, everything is a manageable cost, everything. Um, and to talk to your staff differently on sales or listen, I don't want you wasting your time. Do you mind coming in a little later since the dinner rush is not starting at 4.30? But when you come in, can you do me a favor? Hustle. You're going to do a lot of your closing duties and your side work at the end. And you'd be surprised if you talk with your people in a certain manner. When you're here, I want you to make money. Mm -hmm. I, I will tell you, it changes. You can see they lean forward. The limited menus I love because we can do what we do so much better and we can measure it so we can manage it. And really, I'm amazed at the work that so many of our uh, vendors have done with value added products. But to back to Sean's point, I apologize. I'm digressing. It's the total package that they're coming here for. I finally learned it's not this. It's not about staff personality. It's not about just the food or just the beverage, or just the music. It's everything. Yeah, you know, okay, one last comment from Charlize. Yeah, it's really interesting what, what Peter said. It, it's catering to everybody. Um, I don't necessarily cater to vegans. My audiences, my events are non-vegans, and they are requesting this um, comfort and fulfillment of having something that's going to mimic meat and walk out with that, with that, Feeling. And I've had to completely pull back on using the impossibles and the beyonds um, because it's not affordable. And now I'm having to really venture into using mushrooms and making seitans and lentils and trying to just bringing those meat substitutes together myself by hand at creating something more so than buying pre-made, um, you know, meat substitutes. Yes, yes. You know, we there's so many things we haven't touched on. And it's going to have to be another another time because we're getting near that time where we have to start wrapping up. I just don't want to bring in one point that I that we haven't touched on, which will bridge into the next time. Uh, Peter, just one easy, fast question. How many people in your restaurant only have one job? None. Okay, that's the answer right there. That's the bridge to the next one. What used to be hired to do a job, and this is something we, this is a bridge to the next time, because this is really important. You see a job application now, and it's for a job. When you're in a restaurant or you're in any small company now, nobody can afford to have somebody do one thing. Everyone must wear a lot of hats. So what we're going to do in the last remaining minutes of, of this, um, this breakfast session, first of all, I want to thank everybody here for coming. It was fantastic. The people in the audience, thanks for getting up and spending time with us. Uh, the people who took time from their work, thank you, thank you, thank you. But what I'd like to do is go around the room here in, on the panel and give people that one little point that you, you know, in the case of like Mike and Fred and myself, the point that we picked up on, but the people in the panel, one takeaway that people should know on how to squeeze that dollar and a quarter out. Start with Charlie's. I would say uh, all your veggie scraps, boil them, freeze them, put them in the dehydrator, um, just fine anyways that you can just reuse them. Okay, Peter. I'm talked out. Oh, whoa. <laughs> Impossible. Whoa. Whoa. Everybody, everybody has got, uh, as you can tell, my brain is rattling. It's, it's been a phenomenal, it's been, Larry, this has been the best breakfast I've, I've gotten and heard from so many different ideas and because you're in the whirlpool of all of us and, and listening to everybody, you know, I'm going to work fired up right now. Like to hear that. Sean. Uh, how to squeeze a dollar 25 out, out of a dollar. Waste reduction. 
right? It's, it's managing your waste. It's managing your cost. That is, that is the core of it, whether it's, whether it's vegetable trim or, or making the most out of your staff um, and encouraging your staff to do more with the time that they have. I think that's, I think Peter mentioned that, that is, that is absolutely key. But okay. Waste reduction. Thank you, James. Oh yeah, um, just to really echo what Shirley said about the tea, I really found that interesting because in classical cuisine, we're always taught to use up the trimmings and make stocks and fortify our sauces and things of that nature. So I think there's something to be said for our vegetable trimmings that way. And then it's always helps to buy at the peak of the season when a vegetable is most prolific. Consequently, the costs are a bit lower than when it's out of season. So anyway. Thank you. Fred. I think the one thing that we that we missed, it's incredibly difficult to be Van Gogh or Cezanne or Monet and paint a building and paint a painting and be, be artistic and creative. And at the same time, be expected to figure out how much the canvas costs and how much the paint costs. So that's really, really, really tough. And I think that's the challenge that I walk away from with this today is how do you actually do it? You want to do it and the resources are there. How do you do it? Right, All right. there are different kinds of painters. Yep, <laughs> amen. Yes, yes, Mike. Uh, well, I've come away listening uh, really intently here. I guess, uh, Peter, measure everything and. Uh, Sean, waste reduction. Uh, I think those are really two critical uh, takeaways for me. Okay. Well, we basically know that very soon there's going to be squeezing a dollar twenty-five out of a dollar two, because we can go on with this subject for hours. And I think, as you were listening. As the session went on, the, as Peter said, the whirlpool got faster and faster and faster. And uh, an hour doesn't let us get into that. So, oh, thank you all for coming here. Um, we are going to be throwing uh, this, this video up on uh, YouTube. It'll be there. Um, for those of you who are going to be at the Plant-Based World Expo on September 8th and 9th, um, Sean will be there. Um, Charlize, are you going to be there? Um, on the second day in the culinary room. Okay. I unfortunately won't be at your table. I'm sorry. I know, I know. School. School run. <laughs> it, kids get in the way of everything. Hey, <laughs> Peter will be <laughs> patrolling the halls with uh, Fred and I will be up there with um, what are they eating over there? Uh, uh, in the uh, in the I guess the grand stage I don't know what they call it <laughs> but we'll be there on the 8th uh, at 10 30 in the morning if you're in the event uh, please stop by say hello um, and 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 James will be there with us wave again James so people know who you are James will be there with us um, important to it I might say yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a great event, uh, and otherwise we'll see you on September 14th back on Zoom. So uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thank you, panel, and I just have two things to say. Everyone, please stay positive, test negative. Catch you later. Bye now. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Bye now. Thank you so much.